Hello and welcome to another installment of History Hack. We're joining today um, a very special guest and this has all been set up by Matt Bone um, because we've, we're at an anniversary, aren't we Matt? And this is something, um, an occurrence in World War One that means a lot to you. So why don't you tell us why we're here, who's joined us and, and what we're commemorating? Thanks, Alice. We are very excited to have Roger Sarty with us, who's the history professor at Wilfrid Laurier University. Um, And he's going to talk to us about the 6th of December 1917, um, a date which outside of Canada, very few people actually remember, because on that day, the town of Halifax, Nova Scotia, was partially destroyed by what was at the time the largest explosion in history and known succinctly as the Great Halifax Explosion. So welcome to the show, Roger. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. What a pleasure to be here. To, to sort of set the scene for people who aren't aware, we're just going to get Alex to tell us what was going on in late 1917 that actually led to something so catastrophic happening over 3,000 miles away from the Western Front. So 1917 has been a horrific year, hasn't it? And this is round about the time um, that Passchendaele was wound down. So the Allies have tried this massive uh, effort to win the war um, and it's yet again turned into attritional fighting I mean that's the British side of things the French have had an absolutely torrid year Uh, they tried in April to win the war with the Nivelle offensive Um, they somehow ended up buying into this completely bonkers plan by this uh, general that had done okay in the latter part on a local level at Verdun um, that he was going to win the entire war and that ended up with for the rest of the year the French suffering from mutinies um it it really this is the year that it really starts to get to everybody it's like the equivalent of the second lockdown in corona 1917 it's like it's never going to end they can't see what's going to happen and everybody's starting to draw on their last reserves in terms of manpower and things like that so it's it's a really depressing year and uh coming into the winter of 1917 especially and knowing that yet again um you're going to have to go again the next year. It's very depressing. But I guess 1918 is promising the arrival of the Americans, which uh, everybody is really excited about, especially the French. They're ridiculously excited about that. They actually don't want to do any more fighting until the Americans arrive. Um, So, and at the same time, you've got the Germans planning, knowing this, their last ditch offensive to try and win the war. So it's, it's sort of a key point, but we're about to slow down for winter by the time that this explosion occurs. Yeah, everybody's... Everybody's sort of geared up to go again the following year. Yeah, Alex, if I can, your remarkable comments uh, have big echoes in Canadian history. Mm. And that is in 1917, uh, David Lloyd George, when taking over the British government, uh, pleaded with the Dominion's prime ministers uh, for all reinforcements. And as a result of this, uh, the Canadian government introduced um, uh, conscription, compulsory overseas service, Uh, in the fall of 1917. Uh, It bitterly divided the country. And in fact, um, the the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden, uh, held an election specifically or mainly on the issue of conscription. And in fact, it blew apart the Canadian um, uh, party system. A lot of liberals who were opposed to conscription, a lot of English Canadian liberals came over and joined the Borden government. It was one of the darkest crisis, uh, crises in our political history. And this bitter election uh, was unfolding even as uh, the Halifax disaster took place. So it, it was indeed dark all around the world. I think one thing we haven't mentioned as well, which I think is key, isn't it, Matt, for us, is the convoy system, is the fact that 1917 is the year that the Germans decided to... So they, they wound down their submarine campaign after the Lusitania and after 1915 because of the threat of bringing in the Americans. Um, 1917, they they took the brakes off and they went again and they went with unrestricted submarine warfare. And after the there's sort of no reason to stop it after the Americans had come in um, on the Allied side. And that is why uh, Halifax is booming, isn't it? So, Roger, do you want to tell us about Halifax in the Great War? What's the experience been like up till then for the people of Halifax? Uh, it's been um, very intense um, because. Uh, Canada is extremely worried about the submarine threat uh, right after the Lusitania sinking. Um, And there are a number of dimensions to this. Uh, People don't appreciate it, but Halifax is really effectively part of the Royal Navy's uh, strategic system. 
And uh, the, the British Army had, um, the, the Royal Navy had abandoned the Halifax Dockyard in 1904 to concentrate against uh, Germany. Uh, and, uh, but the Royal Navy said Halifax was still so important as a strategic port uh, that they asked the British Army to keep up a full uh, defended port garrison there. The British Army couldn't afford it and Canada stepped in and took over in 1905, 1906. But agreements were in place so that in the event of war, the Royal Navy would have complete and auto automatic access to all facilities in Halifax Harbor. So when the um, war broke out, uh, Instantly, uh, one of the first mobilization measures of the Royal Navy was to deploy cruisers into Halifax uh, to operate against German trade defense cruisers, and particularly to watch the neutral ports along the, the, the shores of the United States, very near Halifax, uh, because uh, a large number of uh, fast German merchant ships had self-interned themselves in American ports and could conceivably get, the, and matter of fact, some of them did get to sea to operate as, uh, as raiders. So Halifax is absolutely essential to the British trade defense system right from 1914. Um, and in fact, Canada had just had started to develop a Navy and then had stopped because of political controversy. Uh, there's just a tiny stub of a uh, Naval organization in Halifax in 1914. Uh, we do manage to get our one cruiser. We had bought a, a, a British cruiser, the Niobe, uh, for training. We do manage to get her to sea. But above and beyond all, the uh, British government is asking for troops. And so the uh, unspoken agreement is the Royal Navy is going to look after Halifax. And uh, Canada will send troops overseas. We send over uh, uh, 500,000 men overseas by the end of the war. Uh, but then what happens is in 1915, there's a scare over the submarine threat after the sinking of the Lusitania. And Canada says to the Royal Navy, well, yeah, we, we need, uh, you, you've given us these cruisers, but they're useless. Several cruisers like those uh, stationed at Halifax have in fact been sunk by U-boats uh, uh, in European waters. They're just sitting ducks. And we asked for the Royal Navy to send over some proper anti-submarine forces. And the Royal Navy responded they couldn't because they were completely locked down in the European theater. So Canada had to desperately begin to develop its own Navy got um, all small anti-submarine vessels starting in 1915. We're literally talking initially about like seven vessels, um, uh, chartered merchant vessels with a gun or two put on them, uh, that we actually went down to the United States and illegally bought a couple of big yachts. Uh, so the Canadian Navy is just uh, staggering along, but we keep increasing the uh, port services of Halifax because of the uh, growing demands of British trade. And also because Halifax becomes the main troop transport center for Canada, in part because the Royal Navy has ready access there, so we have uh, better uh, protection than at other Canadian ports. Uh, then when the uh, Germans relaunch uh, their submarine campaign in early 1917, um, not just Halifax, but remember the U.S. comes into the war as a result of the renewed submarine campaign. Uh, the U.S. comes in in April of 1917. And so when uh, the British Admiralty in desperation, uh, because the one in four large transports leaving Britain is being sunk in the spring of 1917. And in desperation, the Admiralty begins to organize uh, transatlantic merchant ship convoys. Now, anyone, any of your uh, listeners who's done naval history will know that this is what the Royal Navy automatically did in times of trouble right back into the, the 1500s, but no one thought that it was possible with uh, steamships. Well, it turned out to be quite possible. And Halifax is uh, one of um, four crucial uh, convoy ports uh, in the Western Atlantic. Uh, the others being Hampton Roads in Virginia, New York, uh, then Halifax, and then north of Halifax up in Cape Breton Island, Sydney, Nova Scotia. Uh, there's, there's more to it than that though, because British waters are so insecure. There's a real danger that any uh, neutral ship coming into British waters, uh, now the Admiralty's economic vice on Germany included a vice grip on neutral shipping. And British regulations required neutral ships before going to any European ports. They had to check into a British port to be uh, certified as not carrying anything of help to the enemy. But the losses are so heavy that uh, early in 1917, the British designated Halifax as a British examination port. And uh, an expert uh, security detail comes out from the UK and begins to examine neutral ships in Halifax. In fact, there's so many neutral ships crossing, uh, Halifax Harbor is flooded with as many as 50 neutral ships being examined before they head over to, uh, uh, before they head over to European ports. 
So two two bits that yes. I'd like to crack on with. First is about Niobe herself, because that's where my family comes into this, because my great grandfather was aboard her on the 6th of December. Um, she was a pretty big ship for a very small Navy. It was So what was she doing in Halifax Harbour? And what was, you know, if we can just sort of describe to the listeners Halifax herself, because she's very much a tale of two cities, isn't she? With the, with the, the harbour sort of cutting through the middle of it into the basin. Oh, you know, absolutely. Yeah, the, um, yeah, Niobe, uh, when Canada does its first tentative steps to set up a Navy in 1910, we bought Niobe, which is a 10,000 ton cruiser. A fairly modern, built in 1898, but she was giant with a crew of 700. And we buy her uh, and actually hire a crew of um, retired and uh, long service British seamen to act as a, as, as a training detail in Niobe. We like her because she's big and she was to train up our Navy. Uh, then when the, the Navy falls, uh, the Navy project falls apart in 1911, 1912, 1913, Niobe just sits alongside in Halifax. So in fact, when the war breaks out in 1914, our whole Naval force has dwindled to 300 people. And I hope it requires over 700 to get her to sea. But actually, in a heroic effort, um, the Canadian government, with a large amount of help from Newfoundland, Newfoundland actually, Newfoundland is a separate dominion at that time. But uh, the Royal Navy had set up virtually as a welfare organization, a Royal Naval Reserve Division in Newfoundland. And a lot of their good people came down to Halifax to help us out. Uh, a lot of Canadians uh, with no experience volunteered and came in. We got IOB to sea. And uh, under British officers, of course, the, the RN always loaned us the officers we needed. And she gets to sea in September 1914 and operates in trade defense in the Western Atlantic. Uh, but then in 1915, when the Royal Navy admits the cruisers are useless against submarines, uh, Niobe needs a major refit. And um, the British government offers us uh, free another cruiser to replace Niobe. But when we realize uh, the Royal Navy can do nothing about anti-submarine defense, we decline the offer and uh, deck over Niobe as a floating hulk. And she's put alongside the dockyard. The dockyard, uh, right near where the explosion takes place in Halifax Harbor, is in fact the original dockyard uh, that the Royal Navy set up in 1758, uh, actually specifically to support General Wolfe's expeditions against Louisbourg and then Quebec. So we got deep this week. The dockyard is still on the same site. Um, and the Royal Navy had kept updating it until they abandoned it in, in 1904, but it's still very small. Um, and there's not nearly enough barrack accommodation or classrooms. So Niobe becomes a floating barracks for about a thousand guys undergoing training. Um, Canada, it, because the U-boat situation is so desperate, Canada has actually launched a big program to build our own anti-submarine vessels. And Niobe is alongside uh, training up people for when these ships come down from the Great Lakes shipyards uh, in the spring of 1918. So Niobe is just a floating barracks, so a very large one. And Halifax was a very busy town at this time. Massive port, lots of people coming in and out. What, what sort of uh, makeup was the city when we get to the, sort of the, the days of the explosion? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, Halifax uh, is an interesting history. It always thrives in times of war and uh, actually slumps back in depression in times of peace. And in fact, that cycle has only really dramatically changed um, really since the 1960s. Um, but, uh, and the reason it's such an important port is Halifax is the um, North American all weather port um, closest to Europe. So it's, it's really just a bridge to Europe, which is why it's so vital in war and has been right since it's founded in the 18th century. Uh, in the First World War, yeah, the, the city uh, really, it, it explodes with activity because it is the provincial capital. Um, it's a center, it's a very large army town. When the British army left in 1906, we replaced them with uh, over uh, 1,200 Canadian regulars. Then when the war breaks out, we mobilize uh, the provincial militia and put in a total force of about uh, 3,500 troops. Uh, on top of that, uh, Halifax has become the main troop transport center. So there's, uh, well, on the day of the explosion, there's about 1,700 uh, British and Canadian, uh, actually British citizens in Canada and the United States waiting to go overseas to join the BEF. And there's about 300 of them and about 1,400 uh, Canadian troops waiting to go overseas. Um, that aside, it's uh, 
center for recruiting and instruction for the whole province. Uh, it's got uh, several of the province's universities. Uh, blessedly, in light of the explosion, it's the center of the provincial health system. Uh, it's a city of about 55,000, and in fact, uh, very, very, very active in 1917, and very, very prosperous. I wanted to ask you about the day before the explosion. A boat arrives at Halifax called the Mont Blanc. Who does yeah. she belong to? What is she carrying and why is she there? And, and, and another, there's another boat as well, isn't there? The SS, is it EMO? Yes, the EMO, which is actually an acronym for her uh, Norwegian name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the, the Mont Blanc is a French uh, ship and uh, she's under the control of the French government and under instructions to carry munitions. And she sailed to New York. Uh, it's a bit of complicated arrangements uh, because all ships sail under the overall control of the British Admiralty. The British Admiralty even uh, direct um, uh, French merchant shipping. So she goes into New York and she loads with uh, 3,000 tons, uh, really to capacity. She's literally exploding. That's about her carrying capacity is 3,000 tons. And she's crammed with high explosives of many varieties. And uh, she is a slow ship and too slow to sail with the fast convoys out of um, New York. And so the British uh, uh, shipping administration, uh, or uh, Commodore Wells, uh, Royal Navy uh, Shipping Control Agency, says, well, try Halifax, because uh, we're now sailing slow convoys out of Halifax and they might be able to take you. So Mont Blanc goes out and she goes up the coast and um, comes into Halifax. Now, Halifax has a very elaborate system of defenses, and the harbor is closed by a massive anti-submarine net across the entrance of the harbor. And poor Rem Mont Blanc arrives just as the net is closing for the night. Uh, so she sits there uh, in the harbor approaches uh, under the watch of a very powerful coast battery, uh, which is there to defend against anything suspicious. Uh, if Mont Blanc had proved to do anything suspicious, she would have immediately had warning shots come at her from one of the one of the harbor ports. But uh, there she sits for the night. Uh, meanwhile, it's really paradoxical. Meanwhile, at the other end of the harbor, about um, oh, I guess about 25 kilometers uh, north in Bedford Basin, there is a Norwegian ship, the Emo, which is under charter to the American uh, Belgian Relief Agency, which is sending um, food. Uh, supplies to the Belgian population. The Germans have agreed to this because the Germans themselves have a shortage of food and uh, they do not want to be held responsible for the starvation of Belgium. So they allow the uh, entry of these U.S. Uh, relief agency food supplies. And uh, Emo has just come over from Europe and she's traveling empty to pick up a new cargo, but she has to put into Halifax because she's come from, of course, um, enemy territory. And she puts into Halifax to be examined by the expert Royal Navy security crew in Bedford Basin. And she's been cleared uh, on the day before, on the 5th, and she's hot to go. But her coal supplies have been delayed. And so just like Mont Blanc is stuck at the last minute outside of the anti-submarine nets, Mont, um, Emo is stuck up in Bedford Basin. And uh, both ships are just itching to go. So the 6th of December dawns, the torpedo net is lifted. Mont Blanc starts sailing into the harbour, finally, after a very anxious night, hoping that no submarines pop up. Emo starts sailing the other way. Um, and then a whole bunch of things start to go wrong quite quickly, don't they, Roger? Yes. Uh, it's, um, and in fact, it's not unusual at this time to have these sort of minor traffic accidents in ports. Uh, there are hundreds of them in the war because this is before ship to ship telephone. Uh, so there's no way of communicating other than by steam whistles and you've got three signals. <laughs> one blast, two blasts and three blasts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think one means I'm, I'm heading uh, uh, right or left, I forgot which. Two means I'm heading in the other direction. Three means I'm stopping. But that's all you've got. And so these ships are heading towards each other and um, actually coming out of Bedford Basin, there's, there's a bend in the harbor, so you, your visibility isn't great. So Mont Blanc comes chugging in and she's hugging the Dartmouth shore. She's on the right hand of the harbor, which she is supposed to be. And Emo is chugging out and Emo should be on the Halifax shore, some kilometers away on the right hand side of the harbor. 
But along the Halifax shore, there, there, um, there is uh, an American ship that's come in before Mont Blanc and has um, complicated the channel. And there are a whole bunch of tugboats, or not a whole bunch of tugboats, but two or three tugboats very busy along the Halifax shore. So Emo, instead of hugging the Halifax shore as she is supposed to, she is supposed to do. She really can't do that. And she heads to head over to the other side of the harbor. And as the two ships are coming around the bend, they see each other when they're uh, at that point only about a kilometer apart. And uh, with these unwieldy vessels, that is not a whole lot of sea room. And in a nutshell, we could talk for days about this. Matter of fact, the court case of evidence fills, I think it's 800 printed pages. But what happens in essence is uh, both ships make the wrong decision, uh, make the wrong correction, and they wound up heading into each other. And it's just a glancing blow. The bow of the Emo goes into the, the hull of the uh, Mont Blanc, and it only goes in a few feet. Uh, the Mont Blanc is in no danger of sinking, but immediately sp smoke begins to rise from our hull. And what's happened is that the uh, Emo's hull coming out of the wound in Mont Blanc's um, hull is set off showers of sparks, and that has ignited some of the dry, uh, high explosive uh, picric acid. It's the key, um, uh, the, the key ingredient in uh, Allied military high explosives during the war. And this starts a fire. Um, the French guys on Mont Blanc freak, and they've got a Canadian pilot on board. And um, they realize it's hopeless, and they begin to abandon ship. And as they're going away, they're screaming warnings. Um, uh, the Canadian pilot actually gets out his warnings in English. The French are unfortunately screaming in French and there's very little French spoken in Halifax. It's a, even when I was growing up, it is a more, it's a town that's more English than an English town. Um, and uh, the, actually the Mont Blanc's crew makes it to the far shore and heads into the woods. Uh, meanwhile, um, there is a British cruiser uh, in the stream, uh, very close to where the uh, collision takes place, the High Flyer, and she sends out her large uh, steam um, pinnace, as it's called. Niobe sends out her large steam pinnace uh, to, to help out Mont Blanc, which is smoking. And um, the Halifax Fire Department responds and sends down the Patricia, which is their brand new um, motor powered um, um, fire engine uh, to head down to the docks. And so all of this help is converging while Mont Blanc is drifting out of control onto the Halifax shore. And she just sort of butts up against the wharves. And then a few minutes after 9 a.m., about 19 minutes after the collision, uh, she suddenly explodes. Um, and where this is tragic is the burning ship in the harbor. It's very dramatic. So people have come, uh, people are on their way to work. Uh, Apparently school hours and even some workplace hours had been changed because of the winter light conditions. And so there are a lot of businesses that didn't open until 9.15 or 9.30. And so there are a lot of school children in the streets um, and all sorts of people on their way to work and they stop to watch this burning ship. And of course, there, many of them are caught in the open uh, or uh, even worse behind the windows of their houses uh, by this devastating explosion. Tell us about the explosion. How big was it? Um, what was the immediate effect and surely there must have been instant fatalities oh, oh yes yeah the um the rough uh, what it does is it blows away uh, the northern quarter of the city and um yeah the southern part of the city is protected by citadel hill but the northern part of the city which sadly is also the poorer part of the city it's mostly wooden tenements and so these are all flattened. Uh, now, because this is winter, everybody has their coal uh, stoves on. And so uh, within a few minutes of the explosion, uh, a fire starts. So, so no one knows about exactly how the, the gas was unfold. There's a total of about 1,900 uh, who die as the result of the explosion, and maybe 9,000 who are injured. This is out of a population of 55,000. So we've got a very heavy proportion of casualties. Uh, rough estimates are maybe 1,000 are killed in the explosion, and then uh, maybe the other 900 or 1,000 are caught in the fires um, uh, after the explosion. Uh, the whole time, um, there is a bit of a tsunami in the harbor. Uh, some a big wave washes up on shore. As a matter of fact, yeah, several of the, the small um, harbor craft are washed right up on shore. But um, 
in the latest research, the big revelation for me is there was a black rain, uh, and that is that uh, I guess uh, the particulates uh, from the uh, high explosives, uh, plus uh, all of the, the coal um, uh, from the, the destroyed buildings are swept up in the atmosphere and then fall down in um, an awful black rain uh, to the extent where a lot of the initial casualties are reported as being um, uh, Afro-Canadians, uh, black people. And, uh, but then when they washed the bodies, they discovered no. In fact, they've been completely coated with this uh, sort of coal tar. Uh, and uh, so I guess that's, that's the main effect of the uh, explosion. The most horrifying part are the fires which begin to burn all across the North End in a, in a horrible conflagration. Is there a disproportionate immediate effect then on um, the First Nations population? And is it Africville, they call it? Yeah, there's actually uh, two communities uh, on Bedford Basin and happily protected from the direct force of the explosion by a hill is Africville, which is an old uh, African-Canadian community. It, it, in fact, is not badly hit. Um, I'm just reading some of the latest research on it. Um, turns out uh, it, it, it's got about 400 uh, inhabitants, but most of the blacks actually live uh, in the North End. And there are... Uh, so far as we know, there are about four blacks uh, confirmed killed, though the, the, the records are not great. Um, and as a recent article by a great American scholar pointed out, the real tragedy of the blacks in Halifax is the same as the tragedy for many of the poorer people in Halifax. You know, they're, they're sort of last in line for, for any help. Uh, there is also on the far shore uh, a Mi'kmaq community. The Mi'kmaq was the, the local First Nations. And it's uh, just a small community called Turtle Grove. And it, in fact, is right, it, it gets the direct blast from the explosion. And the, the community is in transition. In fact, they were beginning to, uh, people were beginning to move out uh, into um, uh, uh, reservations uh, further inland. But among the small number of people there, nine are killed. And the, that we know of, again, the records are very, very shaky. And, but the actual community is utterly destroyed and ceases to exist from that moment. So sort of disappears from that moment forward. It's, it's, it's that sort of point there that you, you made briefly. Was, this was an event. Everybody went down to the, the harbour to look at it. You know, in our family legend, my grandfather on Niobe, had, he was peeling potatoes. That's what the, the family legend says when his friends came down to say, come up and watch a ship on fire in the harbour. And that was sort of everybody's reaction, wasn't it? It was something exciting on a, on a cold winter's day. Oh, oh, absolutely! It was like a yeah, like a, a bit of a yeah, a bit of entertainment. <laughs> yes, you're quite right. So, what did people like your great grandfather? Um, what did the people of Halifax do, Roger? How did they instantly react to the explosion? Uh, it looks like, um, and I, I've edited the work of Joseph Scanlon, who uh, uh, late author. He, uh, he he died in 2015 and left this manuscript, and he shows in some detail that. Um, Everybody, well, you can't say everybody, but the response of the population was highly intelligent. And he puts this in an interesting framework. All of his work to this point had, in fact, been in things like 9-11 in New York, recent disasters. And he discovered, uh, you know, those legendary stories about how in New York, people in the towers, in the face of a horrible threat, they risked their own lives uh, to do an orderly evacuation of the building. And how firefighters, uh, even though they knew the situation was hopeless, responded very courageously. And it turns out that Halifax was exactly the same. Uh, on Niobe, uh, an interesting example, uh, it's somewhat controversial. And Niobe, freakishly, Niobe is very close to the explosion. But the explosion, the main force seems to have passed over the ship in the dockyard and over a lot of the ships. Um, and so Niobe is rocked horrifically. And uh, there was what was described as a panic in the ship because she's not a, a true warship. She's just a floating barracks and training center for a lot of young kids who have very little experience. But it turns out that the so-called panic was is a lot of the guys in the ship uh, had their families living in the North End, uh, just across the railway tracks, now where the fires are starting. And so the guys from the Niobe spontaneously, there was the more experienced guys were absolutely heroic and got control of the ship. The ship was torn loose from its moorings. They did an incredible job of securing the ship. And meanwhile, a lot of the other guys ran into the town and began to do rescue work. Uh, meanwhile, there was um, two American ships, warships in port and uh, three British warships. 
And they all, within minutes, put down their boats and sent crews into the dockyard and joined the Canadian sailors in rushing in to do life-saving in this conflagration. It was absolutely unbelievable. These guys were remarkable. And they keep up at it for, uh, you know, through the whole of the conflagration. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the main army barracks is right near the dockyard. And in fact, it was hit uh, as badly as the dockyard. There's about 500 uh, wounded, mercifully only about 20 killed. Uh, but again, the soldiers uh, do the same. They go rushing into the town to do rescue work. Uh, and meanwhile, other soldiers, uh, even the trainees, do wonderful work rescuing their, their, their own injured people. Um, the main part of the garrison is uh, farther out on the harbor in the various forts. And they get boats as quickly as they can. They rush in. And so there's a, a, what be rapidly becomes a highly organized response. Um, I guess to, to jump up to the upper level, what's remarkable is the mayor of the city, thank God the um, city hall is in the protect, under uh, the protection of uh, Citadel Hill. It's not badly hit. And the city councilors immediately begin to gather right after the explosion. The mayor is out of town. He's actually running for office in the federal election. But the deputy mayor who just runs a, a men's clothing store gets together the best and the brightest uh, among the city elite and organizes a relief committee with all sorts of subcommittees, uh, with um, uh, expert people in logistics. Uh, the medical, uh, the uh, army commander, General Benson, is a true hero. He comes in, offers full support. Uh, his chief of medicine, uh, Lieutenant Colonel McKelvey Bell, uh, becomes the head of the city uh, uh, medical relief committee. Uh, so within an hour or less, you initially you have a heroic response, then within an hour or less, you have a highly organized response. Um, this is somewhat controversial because there is a panic about an hour after the explosion. What was described as a panic, it turns out it wasn't. Uh, down by the dockyard, there is a big military magazine and it had apparently caught fire and word gets out that this ma magazine might blow. So people are not panicking. What they're doing is the logical thing, getting clear. But uh, as Joe Scanlon's work shows, even as people are fleeing to get from the North End, uh, they are helping uh, injured people uh, uh, quite heroically in, in many circumstances. So uh, yeah, to round it out, um, uh, what Joe Scanlon argues that in fact, um, the local authorities and the military authorities, especially with all the wonderful British and American seamen available, they have things pretty well under control within about, uh, within 24 hours or less uh, before large scale assistance begins to arrive from outside. And then as Joe Scanlon argues, and as he says that the same thing happens in 9-11 and every other big disaster, then the relief parties begin to arrive by train from Central Canada and from the United States. And they're so horrified at what they see, they announce that they're the heroes. They said, we arrived in this nightmare scene. Everything was chaos and we saved the day. And in fact, as Joe says, it's exactly the same in 9-11 and other disasters. Uh, the local people, in fact, had uh, got most of the injured off to safety, had started great first aid work. Actually, the military hospitals are, are highly organized, beginning to give very good quality care within, within hours of the explosion. Uh, things were, in fact, uh, pretty much under control. It just looked ghastly to the people who were just <laughs> 24, 48 hours later. Matt, what was your great-grandfather's experience? Um, so the, 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 the story that we, we had was after the explosion, he, he he remembers the so he said chaos on the ship that passed quickly and we rushed into town um his he always said that his first thought was to get word out to say to everyone that he was okay um and you know the the effect of that was he was he was deployed into into the into the, the, the north part of the city to help the rescue efforts um and he says he knew someone in the telegraph office so that as soon as the lines were up again, he was able to get a message out, which famously reached my great grandmother before word of the explosion had filtered its way into the middle of nowhere, Ontario, where they lived. Uh -huh. um, but off off the back of that, I think the um, one of the very interesting parts of this story is the relief effort, because word travels by telegraph, gets out very quickly. Um, and this is where the sort of history of the, the explosion does diverge a bit because a lot of the focus goes to Boston, which is a long way away from Halifax. Um, and 
a major relief effort was was put up from there, but also from Central Canada itself. Do you want to explain what happened there, Roger? Yes, it's well, it, it's quite inspiring. Um, yeah, Boston, not just Boston, uh, but Maine um, and Rhode Island uh, and all the New England states uh, raised major relief efforts. And uh, part of the reason for this is, is, is sentimental, the historic links between New England, or the Boston states, as Nova Scotians call it, and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are very, very close. Um, you know, Nova Scotia was sort of the 14th colony, and uh, it was really Massachusetts that uh, drove uh, the, um, the British government uh, to, to lay claim to Nova Scotia in the 18th century and to develop it. Uh, but the families moved back and forth. Even my family, uh, among my, my, my great uncles, a uh, typical family of uh, seven great uncles, two of them went to the Boston states and did, did well in business. And this is absolutely um, typical. So the, the family ties are very strong. And there are massive relief, relief efforts uh, from all of the New England states. Um, in the, um, um, I hesitate to give precise figures, uh, but within Halifax, the military and the provincial health system and uh, with help from all the small towns in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, they doubled, I think there's 80 doctors in town when the explosion takes place. Uh, they, they managed to double that. And so they have like upwards of 150 towards 200. And then when the um, New England uh, trains begin to arrive 48 hours later, there's another 150 doctors who come in. So they essentially double the effort. Um, and in fact, what's interesting is that the local doctors had everything under control. And by the time the um, doctors arrived from the US in the uh, about uh, starting 48 hours, uh, 72 hours after the explosion, uh, the real crisis has passed. And um, a lot of the US doctors only remained for a few days to help with the cleanup. Uh, what's absolutely vital is um, nurses and the American nurses are absolutely treasured as are nurses from central Canada and, and other parts of the country. Um, but it, it's far beyond just doctors and nurses. Um, uh, Boston, especially Boston, uh, raises hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in relief money. Uh, the, the local businessmen put together a program uh, whereby um, catalogs go up to Nova Scotia and the local Nova Scotia relief people are able to offer new furniture and house goods for free from the Boston states. Yeah, extraordinary generosity uh, at the time. And uh, where it really blew me up, and they still need more research on this, is um, I got a bit of an interesting personal story. In, in 2017, we had a conference down in the Navy dockyard uh, for the centenary. And we went on a tour of what's called Admiralty House, which is the old British commander in chief's residence, big, beautiful Georgian mansion. And um, it's now a museum, but uh, it was being developed as a naval hospital in 1917. It was too badly damaged and had to be abandoned. But in the displays uh, uh, in the museum, uh, they make the point that af years after the explosion, there was a Massachusetts medical unit who remained in the north end of Halifax because they had been so horrified at the conditions they found. It was like um, the very worst of North American or British industrial slum towns. They discovered you know, rampant venereal disease, um, you know, rampant tuberculosis, uh, you name it. And they set up a special health unit uh, to try to uh, help cope with this public, you know, an unrecognized public health disaster. And uh, between their efforts and uh, Nova Scotia's own efforts, a lot of people trace back the beginnings of uh, the modern uh, healthcare and social work um, uh, communities uh, in Nova Scotia, and in some ways it was pioneering in Canada and advanced even by uh, standards in the U.S. I think it's brilliant to hear how generous people were um, in terms of the civilians getting back on track after this horrific explosion. Uh, in terms of, but the war is still raging, how long does it take Halifax to get back on a war footing? Because obviously the convoys are still needed, the military infrastructure is still needed, um, we still have nearly a year of war to fight. So how quickly did that get back on track? Uh, what's remarkable is instantly. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Uh, the fluky thing is uh, there was a convoy getting ready to go to sea, a large convoy of uh, close to 40 vessels. And that's why there are three big British uh, escort cruisers there, the 
uh, Shanguinola, which is a, an armed merchant cruiser, uh, the Knight Templar, uh, which is another merchant cruiser, and then the, uh, which, by which I mean a, a, a small um, liner uh, converted for naval purposes, and then a, a proper light cruiser, the High Flyer. What a great name for a ship, the Knight Templar. Oh, isn't it? Isn't it, oh, isn't it? <laughs> and um, uh, the uh, convoy, in fact, uh, because, uh, the, as I said, the force of the explosion, it doesn't actually just do heavy damage right at the harbor level. And most of the ships are okay. High Flyer loses about 20 people, and uh, she's fairly badly damaged. But within a few days, she's back in service. Knight Templar and Shanguinola, that's hard thing to pronounce, um, are, are virtually undamaged. And none of the merchant ships waiting to go out for convoy are, are damaged. Um, almost, a, I guess I should mention here that one of the heroes of the explosion is um, Rear Admiral Bertram Chambers. And I don't know if he's well known. He should be. Um, when the convoy organization is set up in early 1917, uh, Chambers is sent over by the Admiralty to organize the, the convoys in Canada. And he's a retired RN captain of long service. Um, he had, um, I got into the Navy, I think in the 1860s. He'd served with the Australian Navy. So he knew about uh, colonial navies and, and liked them. And he had helped set up convoy arrangements in British waters before he comes over to Canada. So he's very, very good. Interestingly, he's working with a mainly Canadian staff. Um, and he works very, very well with them. And he, he seems to have been an absolute prince of a man. And uh, right after the explosion, Chambers, not even heroic, he gets onto a small harbor tug. And he goes up the harbor to see what the situation is and when he can get the convoy out and who needs help. And he visits the dockyard, uh, the Canadian dockyard, and uh, sees it's in flames. And he uh, runs into um, Walter Hose. Actually, the commander of the dockyard has been badly cut about the eyes and not blinded, but he can't carry on. So um, a Canadian captain, again, this is hilarious. The links between Canada and the UK are extreme. Walter Hose is the so-called Canadian commander of the dockyard. Walter Hose is old Royal Navy. Uh, he got fed up with the Royal Navy. He's a very hyper energetic kind of guy. Uh, and even though the Canadian Navy was in a terrible shape in 1912, he transferred to the Canadian Navy, wholly transferred to the Canadian Navy, did very, very well. And uh, he takes over the dockyard in this panic. And up comes Bertrand Chambers. And Chambers says, uh, not Hose, you know, doing an awfully good job. And Hose says, well, thank you, sir. And uh, Chambers says, you know, of course, I have no authority here uh, on shore. Uh, you know, I'm a British officer who organizes convoy at sea. But you seem to have an, off, an awful lot on your hands there, old chap. And, and the host says, yes, indeed. And Chambers says, well, I know city council is beginning to get things together. Do you mind if when I go back into town, I speak for the Canadian Navy? And Ho says, oh, please, sir, if you would do that. So Chambers uh, represents the Canadian Navy and works with the city council, and he works hand in glove with the Canadian Army Commander, General Benson. Uh, so it's, it's really Admiral uh, Richard Chambers and um, General Benson who cooperate on everything. And uh, under Benson's direction, because this is Canadian soil, uh, Chambers arranges for the American crews from the ships, uh, the crews of the American ships, for the crews of the British ships, all to uh, help uh, the soldiers and the Canadian uh, Navy sailors uh, in the relief effort. It's quite an inspiring story. But at any rate, Chambers in his run up the harbor uh, sees that in fact, it looks like the harbor is fairly clear. And one of the things he asks who's to do is the Canadian Navy immediately gets out and does a survey of the harbor to see if the tsunami has ruined the harbor bottom or created any obstacles or the wrecks are gonna be an obstacle. And within hours, they confirm that the port is clear. And uh, the convoy sails only a few days later than scheduled um, after uh, High Flyer is, uh, is repaired. And so, uh, boom, uh, there's virtually no hesitation in the convoy organization running out of Halifax. And similarly, with all of the fortifications and the anti-submarine nets, those are all farther out the harbor and none of them have been damaged. So Halifax is virtually untouched as a strategic port and it just soldiers on. Uh, but meanwhile, with the very, um, there's so many people who were, were so generous. Um, 
interesting, no one in the Canadian government or in the British government wanted to talk about the issue of who is responsible for this. Because it's, uh, the ship was, it was a French ship uh, sailing under Admiralty direction. <laughs> From America. So, <laughs> from America. It had been loaded by American longshoremen with oh. American-produced explosives. Got to be someone at the dockyard in New York with a German granddad that they could have pinned it on, right? Yeah, well, they, in fact, um, they, they, within Halifax, they tried to do that. There are a number of people with uh, German names who are roughed up. And thank God that the... the within hours or, or a few days that they're all released and, and left alone. But no, you're quite right. There's an enormous paranoia. Well, well my uh, grandfather, great grandfather's name was Eckmeyer. So yeah. probably a good thing he was in uniform. <laughs> yes, very, very lucky he was. Um, but at any rate, um, the British government, and I've, I've forgotten some, but the British government immediately sends very heartwarming condolences and releases uh, some tens of thousands of pounds, the equivalent of uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars today. And the Canadian government similarly is extremely generous. And they, uh, within days, well, I, pardon me, within a month of the explosion, they set up a new Canadian federal government agency. Uh, you know, for your British listeners, uh, Canada is a federal system. Uh, so we have, uh, actually loosely modeled on the U.S. Uh, so uh, Halifax is in Nova Scotia, which is a province, much like the U.S. state. It has I hope you can government. count votes faster. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is terrible. We were joking. Uh, in Canada, our elections from the day the election is called to the election, it takes six weeks. And we all go to the same local school or church, and there's the same group of wonderful volunteers at work. <laughs> And no one waits in any lineups, and we know the result within hours. And we're thinking maybe Elections Canada should uh, offer to, 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 to outsource the organization of the U.S. elections. <laughs> it's no <laughs> small um, achievement for the federal government to be doing anything at this point. Hasn't their building burned down? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the, so the Canadian government's burned. not had it easy either, have they? No, there was uh, some work... Um, Workmen were doing repairs, and I guess uh, a blowtorch uh, from coal embers and uh, the gorgeous Canadian Parliament building burned down in 1916. So the Parliament had to move into the National Museum building, uh, into the amphitheater there. And again, just to, just as a sidelight, you're asking about paranoia. Uh, in both the case of the, that's what uh, made me think of it. In case in the case of both the Parliament buildings burning and in the Halifax explosion, there are many reports of people that they saw a German Zeppelin flying over. They couldn't even find Cambridge. So I, <laughs> I think yeah. finding Canada will be a huge uh, yeah. achievement. Navigation wasn't their strong point, definitely at the beginning yeah. of the war. Um, yeah. but, oh, no, no, certainly. Conspiracy theories are nothing new, are they? Yeah. Well, why don't we know more about this? And what is the legacy um, outside Halifax of this disaster? It's... Uh, here, a warning, I'm a history prof, and uh, beat me if I start lecturing. <laughs> uh, but as, as uh, near as I can figure it, it's, it's very well known within Canada. Uh, but what is interesting is Nova Scotia is um, uh, a world unto itself. Uh, to give you an idea of how remote it is, when I moved from Halifax to Toronto in 1963, and I went into a downtown school in, in Toronto. Um, the other kids made fun of me. They asked me if I was from England. <laughs> it's a pity that the local accents were so strong then. You know, everything has been homogenized by broadcasting since then. Mm. And Nova Scotia is this little world unto itself. It is, it is uh, 24 hours by rail from Ottawa to Halifax. So that's how far. Uh, when you're in Ottawa, you are a 10-hour drive from New York, Boston, or Washington. But you're about a 40-hour drive from Halifax. <laughs> yeah, and it really is. A, so it's the reason not many people do the pilgrimage to all the Titanic graves, because that's where everyone is buried, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's really stuck way, way out there. And it's a little world uh, until uh, in my lifetime, it was a, a world unto itself. So um, like when I was growing up in the 50s, uh, all of my older family members remember the Halifax explosion. My, my grandfather 
was a doctor in a town a uh, hundred miles away and he came in to do emergency surgery. And so no one really looked on it as history. It was sort of family stories. And uh, there was um, an Anglican priest who did a, a PhD thesis on it that was published in 1920. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty odd work uh, talking about really how Halifax goes through trial and redemption. Um, but other than that, there is no serious work done on it until in 1941, a Nova Scotian author who makes it big in central Canada publishes a novel called Barometer Rising, an historical novel uh, based on the explosion. And the author, Hugh McLennan, had been there uh, as a teenager. So it's, it's a very vivid, it's a wonderful book. But this is the, the, the best-selling novel that is really the main memory of the explosion until the uh, uh, late 50s. And um, as I mentioned to Matt, you'll love this. It's always outsiders who bring out the story. And there's a Brit, um, a British uh, TV uh, producer, writer by the name of Michael Bird, and he's, he's visiting Nova Scotia, and he's fascinated. Yeah, there, there it is, the town that died. And so the first well-researched historic book comes out, in I think, in the early 60s uh, by a Brit. And the story gets funnier. Uh, the next well-researched account comes out in the 80s uh, from uh, Janet Kitts. Well, she's an outsider, too. Uh, she's a Scottish lady whose husband moves to Halifax, and she moves there. And again, like Michael Bird, she arrives, and she's startled at this amazing story and devotes the rest of her life to producing several excellent books. Unfortunately, we lost her a year or two ago. And uh, to make a long story short, serious scholarly research into the explosion didn't begin until the 1980s and the 1990s. And it seems there's been an ex there was a a great burst of interest at the centenary. I think it was feeding off of the interest in the 100th anniversary of the First World War that began in 2014 and continued. And there was an enormous amount of interest in the Halifax explosion. Uh, as I mentioned, I went to a conference there. And so it seems to have really uh, arrived on the international stage uh, with the upsurge of interest in the First World War more generally. Uh, but uh, it's also very well remembered um, or, well, there is a link with Boston and uh, well known. I don't know if it's still continuing, but Nova Scotia always sends a huge Christmas tree to uh, Boston every year in a ceremony of thanks for the absolutely incredibly uh, generous help uh, uh, Massachusetts gave. They, they still do. The, uh, Cana the great Canadian forces in the US Twitter feed was talking about it the other day because the tree oh. had arrived apparently. It's wonderful because there had been some talk that maybe, you know, it's been a hundred years, maybe that's long enough. So I'm so glad that it's continuing. So one of the things I think to, to put this in context is we recently had that terrible explosion in, in Beirut, which, you know, it, you know the, the, the pictures that, you know, are sort of etched on people's minds. Halifax by size was about three times the explosive force of that, wasn't it? I think it's one kiloton in, in Beirut and it was about three yeah. in Halifax. I definitely would not be doing my job properly if I hadn't already been tapping Roger up for an article for the Great War Group, would I? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody should be a member of the Great War Group. Absolutely, they should. There's, 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 our, there's our plug for that, Dan. Um, <laughs> You know, explosions seem to capture it. And with this lack of, of work, do you think that the new book that you've just edited will maybe help put, put some of that right as it's as a little bit of history is starting to get out? Yes, I, I certainly hope so. Because as I say, the, the book uh, that I edited is by uh, Joe Scanlon, who is a journalist and a specialist in disaster studies. I mean, he's, he's actually better known in the States than in Canada. He has the disaster studies is a much bigger field in the States and he was one of the pioneers down there. Um, and so I hope that all through the book, he draws parallels with 9-11 and various other more modern disasters. So I hope it, it, it uh, enables people to put it into perspective and uh, uh, it, it really recognize it in modern terms. Uh, not just the scale of the disaster, but how remarkably uh, the city and the country and our neighbors responded um, at a moment of crisis. I was going to say, God, to put it in modern context, um, I don't know if people are aware of it in Britain, but after 9-11, uh, Canada just 
automatically joined in the American response to 9-11. And we immediately opened all of our airports because the U.S. had closed its airspace. So all of the um, U.S. flights returning from overseas, they landed at Canadian airfields and small towns in some remote areas put up, um, uh, you know, thousands of unexpected guests uh, for days on end. Uh, in fact, uh, the control of North American airspace uh, is a joint Canadian-American endeavor under the North American uh, Aerospace Command. So uh, at the uh, American Aerospace um, Control Center at 9-11, the second in command was a Canadian general. Um, and so, uh, you know, people think this is, this is just all modern stuff, but it's, it's a tradition that, the, 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 that goes uh, far back, and especially in these times, <laughs> of rampant nationalism, <laughs> people turning their backs on alliances. I think it's really an inspiring story on how everybody pulled together at a terrible time. A colleague of mine was flying to New York on 9-11 and ended up spending what he called a lovely five days in Halifax yeah. when, the, the, when their flight was diverted and the airspace was closed. And you'll understand why when uh, the president slapped tariffs on Canadian aluminum because he said Canadian aluminum posed a national security threat to the United States. We were incensed. <laughs> yeah, and if you've, if you've made a Canadian angry, you know you've overstepped the well, it takes It takes a lot to do that. <laughs> yeah. Roger, thank you so much. This has been so interesting, and thank you for coming on and filling a gap in people's knowledge and for commemorating the Halifax explosion with us. Just tell everybody, again, um, tell us about your book and where they can get hold of it. Yeah, it's... Um... It's called Catastrophe. <laughs> uh, it's by Joseph Scanlon, uh, and I am the academic editor. And uh, the best, uh, it's a uh, university press uh, distributes it through all of the, the big outlets. So you can get it through um, uh, Amazon, or uh, if you want to give a Canadian firm some business, uh, indigo.ca. <laughs> no, absolutely. Any business we could take away from Amazon, they've got enough. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you so much and come back anytime to discuss some more Canadian history with us. Thank you. This is a beautifully prepared session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Roger. Join us tomorrow. We will be talking to Frank McDonough. He's an absolute legend. He has a new book out. It's the next instalment in his history of Nazi Germany during the war. Uh, so don't miss that. It is brilliant. And he just he can waffle for England and everything he says is amazing. So don't miss that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on youtube we are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms so you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time so do go over there and subscribe